The American composer Christopher Tin is one of today's most innovative and influential composers. His compositions for film, video games, and the concert stage have won him two Grammy Awards and a whole plethora of songwriting and video game awards as well. The music that he composed for the video game Civilization IV has the honor of being the first music written for a video game to win a Grammy Award, which was won in 2011. Christopher Tin's music has been performed at Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, and the Hollywood Bowl, and has been performed by ensembles throughout the world. This year, his latest project, To Shiver the Sky, an oratorio completely devoted to the wonder of flight, was released on recording and has since gone on to reach the position of number one on the U.S. top classical crossover albums for Billboard. Joining me here in the virtual studio through Zoom is composer Christopher Tin. Welcome here. It's great to meet you. Great to meet you as well, Chris. Uh, when uh, Amanda from Crossover Media sent me the audio, I was really enthusiastic to listen to the oratorio and I've listened to it twice through. I want to congratulate you on just, it's such a great piece of music. I mean, it's cinematic and it's such a perfect, the music fits so perfectly for the oratorio, which is this whole inspiration uh, of flight. I guess my first question that popped in my head when I received the recording is, what, why flight? What is it about the men and women that freed us from the shackles of gravity that you found so interesting? What did, why, why were you so inspired to write an oratorio inspired by flight? Well, I mean, achieving flight is an amazing metaphor, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's, it, it's all about like becoming something greater than ourselves, right? Defying our limitations and, and, and you know, you're becoming this, this, uh, this, this new form of ourselves, right? I mean, it's, it, it really is about um, uh, sort of a reminder of what we humans are able to achieve. And I found that just really uplifting no pun intended, um, and, and inspiring as well. And, and I thought that that would make just sort of great musical subject matter. But really, it's not just about flight, it's also about the story of how we achieve flight that I find really exciting and fascinating. I mean, this was a multinational, multi-century collaboration across all borders and boundaries and languages and peoples that led us to where we could be in 1969 when we actually put a man on the moon. Um, you know, that level of international collaboration where, you know, all of the, uh, the ideas of great men and women from across the centuries and across different cultures could come together to build to this moment was something I found very appealing in this day and age as well. Right. I mean, I should mention for our listeners, the oratorio isn't just about air travel, it's about space flight. Uh, I know one of the texts that you drew on was uh, from Jules Verne, and there's this wonderful text where he's saying it's not only about flying in the sky, but it's also to the planets and to the stars, and it's, a, it's just a remarkable theme. Maybe can we start from the beginning? One of the things I found so fascinating about the project is it was a Kickstarter. Can you talk about how that process began and what the end result of the crowdfunding was when you kickstarted the project? Sure, sure. I mean, this is actually my third album, so I already have a, a bit of a, a fan base already built around my previous two albums. I decided to do a Kickstarter for the first time because I thought it'd be fun to incorporate um, my community into the process of making this album. I mean, it is a monumentally large album. I mean, the, ho the forces on it are enormous. Um, and I'd never really had any sort of crowdfunding campaign or any sort of real, you know, uh, I, I guess, direct connection um, to, to my fans other than social media before. And so we, we decided to try this out as an experiment and it became wildly successful. Um, and it smashed the record for classical music Kickstarters, I mean, by a long shot. And, um, you know, over the course of the following two years, I was able to bring the fans on board the process quite, quite uh, very intimately, I would say. I mean, from the very beginning, I knew I wanted to make an album about flight, but I didn't know the particulars. And so what I actually did is I actually crowdsourced the, the ideation, you know, of ideas, right? I, I said to my fans, you know, I'm making an album about flight. What do you think belongs on it, right? And a lot of them wrote back with a lot of great ideas, 
many people actually wrote to me who were from the aerospace industry or who were pilots themselves, or you know, maybe their, their, their grandfather served in World War II. I mean, it was really a concept that, that resonated with a lot of people. And I was able to build the album around a lot of these ideas. I mean, like I was able to uh, incorporate this idea that the development of avi aviation technology was intrinsically tied into the military, for example. That's a recurring motif across the, the course of the album. Um, you know, things like that. Like I just hearing from people and making this sort of a, a community uh, developed idea was, was a really powerful thing, I think, and really brought the fans in closer to the process. Uh, it's, it's so great. It leads me so well into the next question. Um, the oratorio is based on text from 11 different sources. Can you maybe talk us through the oratorio and how did you decide on the texts for, for the oratorio? How did that process start and how did you narrow it down? Well, um, I mean, there are 11 movements and that's kind of symbolic in a way. It's symbolic of the Apollo 11 mission when we actually successfully landed a man on the moon. Um, for me, this idea of the history of flight wasn't just about, you know, who did this first, you know, who crossed the Atlantic first or who achieved first flight, right? I mean, there are some noticeable uh, omissions. I mean, the Wright brothers aren't actually represented on the album, neither is Charles Lindbergh, um, neither is Neil Armstrong for that matter. Um, for me, the idea of achievement of flight was not just about putting aircraft into the sky. It was also about this exploration of what it means to be in the sky, you know, from the medieval era and, and, and moving forward, what it means to be closer to the heavens, closer to God. And so over the course of the 11 movements, which progress more or less chronologically, we tell this story, right? We start with Leonardo da Vinci's writings on uh, building a flying ma a machine. And the first track is called Sonio de Volare, which means the dream of flight. After that, we go into the medieval era when Hildegard von Bingen talks about uh, people wanting to fly so that they can be closer to heavenly things. Then we go to the Daedalus and Icarus myth, right? I mean, uh, you know, that was a myth from antiquity, but it, it became very popularized in the, in the Renaissance. And, you know, then we're talking about flight as a means of escape, right? Of, of breaking free from the, the earthly bonds and, and literally escaping and, and, and traversing land and sea. Um, and then we get into more spiritual dimensions. I mean, I actually use Dante in the fourth movement. Dante, yeah. there's this great quote where he says, uh, oh mankind born to fly, wherefore at a little wind dost thou fall. And, and that introduces the, this idea that the history of aviation is actually the history of failure as well. And that um, every time we fall, you know, the, we have to get back on our feet. Um, uh, after that, I go to Nicholas Copernicus and talking about astronomy, the heliocentric uh, vision of the universe, right? Um, in a way, I, I consider Dante and Copernicus to be, to be sort of uh, two sides of the same coin. You know, Dante mapped out the heavens and hell uh, for us. You know, he, he mapped out our spiritual universe while Copernicus mapped out the actual stars. And then from there, we go to Jules Verne, right? The first, the very first science fiction writer, the, the guy who pioneered the genre, um, and his landmark book, From the Earth to the Moon. And he talks about how we're going to build these vehicles to take us to the moon and to the stars and back again. After that, we get into um, the 20th century, right? Uh, track seven is about the, the age of airships. And it's a setting of, of uh, Ferdinand von Zeppelin's speeches about, about his... his um, his invention, the Zeppelin, which ultimately, as we know, was co-opted by the German government for dropping bombs onto London in 1915. And in 1937, you know, perhaps one of the most high profile aviation disasters ever, the Hindenburg explosion. But after that, we have Amelia Earhart. The words of the great feminist icon and aviation pioneer, um, she sings, uh, she, I use a poem of hers called Courage. After that, we go to um, uh, Robert J. Oppenheimer. Um, obviously, one of the darkest moments of aviation history is how the Enola Gay dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And so I set the words that Oppenheimer spoke to himself when he first saw the first explosion, the Trinity test explosion. After that, we get to Yuri Gagarin, um, height of the Cold War. He's the first man launched into space. And when he comes back, he says, please let us not destroy ourselves with nuclear bombs, right? He says, I have seen the earth from space 
and it is beautiful. People, let us preserve this beauty and not destroy it. And right on the heels of that, the American president, John F. Kennedy in 1962 saying, we are going to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon because it is hard, not because it's easy. And we don't want space to be this next frontier of the military. We want space to be filled with instruments of discovery and science and not weapons of mass destruction. And that's where the album ends on this very positive note, right? That we can achieve great things when we pull together um, with peaceful means in mind. Um, it's a powerful message, I think. And that's what really drew me to this whole story. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful concept. Uh, I next want, I want to touch on the title of the piece, To Shiver the Sky. Can you tell us how you came up with the title? It's actually a quote from Rudyard Kipling. It's from a poem called The Conundrum of the Workshops, which is actually a, a poem about um, artistic insecurity, actually, if you read it. It's all about the devil whispering into a, an artist's ear. It's wonderful, but is it art? You know, so it doesn't actually, the poem itself doesn't have anything to do with flight, but there's a line in there that I thought was just stunningly beautiful. And it goes, they builded a tower to shiver the sky and wrench the stars apart. And that phrase, to shiver the sky, I just thought was so evocative. And just, you know, it just painted a, a great picture of like aircraft flying through the sky, you know, and the, the, the little, you know, the clouds trembling and, and rocket thrusters launching spacecrafts out of the, the, the gravitational pull of the earth. I mean, it, it was just, just such, such a visceral phrase that I thought, mm. I need to make this the title of my album. Oh, that's marvelous. Um, one of the things about the album that I find fascinating is it's written in so many different languages. There's Latin, French, Sanskrit, Polish, German. Like it, it's, a, it's written in a wide variety of languages, obviously because of the different texts that you set it to. Did composing in different languages pose specific problems? Like, is it harder to set Polish, for example, than it is Latin? Like, did you come across any major issues setting the different languages? You know, the challenge in setting languages is less about the language itself, but it's more about the text that you use. So for example, if you find a poem that's already very metrical, it's very easy to set that to music, right? But if what you're trying to set to music is actually, for example, just a, a paragraph of, of dialogue or a speech by John F. Kennedy, that's not inherently metrical. So that poses some musical challenges for setting it. But I think the greater challenge is when the singers get to the recording studio and record, some languages are frankly just harder to, to figure out the pronunciation for. Polish is a great example of that. It is a very, very challenging language for a non-Polish speaker to, to, to work out. Um, fortunately, I'm no stranger to actually working in a lot of uh, unusual languages. I've set uh, texts uh, ranging from uh, Swahili to to Sanskrit to Proto Indo European uh, to Old Norse to Ancient Greek, I'm quite accustomed to working in in foreign languages, and so it's actually become kind of a hallmark of all my albums the uh, the multilingual aspect of it. And I've seen interviews with you where you talk about the fact that you sort of live up to your name, Christopher Traveler's friend, right? It's you let you enjoy traveling and getting around the world and taking in uh, different cultures and uh, different different ethnic ethnicities as well, right? I sure do, and well, I I did. <laughs> it's a little harder these days, but That's, yeah, I yeah. absolutely did. I, I I consider myself a you know a citizen of the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, the album was recorded at Abbey Road Studios in London with Royal Philharmonic and Chorus with other special guests. What was that like? It must have been thrilling. And is it the first time that you've recorded uh, at Abbey Road? I've actually recorded at Abbey Road quite a bit. It's a, it's a wonderful space. Um, and the, the staff there is amazing. The engineers are amazing. And, um, you know, there's something about stepping into a, a, a place that's steeped in history. You want to, in a way, live up to the legacy of the building that you're in, right? Um, it was a great experience. I mean, I, I'm very fortunate in that I, I get to work with some of the greatest orchestras and, and singers in the world. The Royal Philharmonic Orchestra has been my, they've been my collaborators for the last, um, you know, 12 years now. And, and I always love working with them. And the Royal Opera Chorus, they were amazing to work with on, on this album. It was our first collaboration together, but hopefully there will be more. And how many sessions did it take to record, to record the album? Like how many actual recording sessions were there? I, 
believe that the orchestra was done probably in about uh, 10 hours total. Um, and the, the choral uh, portions of the album, I mean, those were probably another 12 hours. The soloists were another dozen hours. I mean, it's, it's you know, there's, there's quite a bit of recording that goes into a project like this. Right, and especially in a project like this, where as listeners will hear <clears throat> after the interview, it's like you say, it's written very much on a grand scale. I mean, it's it's everything. It's huge orchestra, huge chorus. And it, as you would expect, has this very sort of epic feel, especially when you're dealing with a subject like flying and going to the stars. Um, I guess, what's next for you? Uh, I know that with COVID, public performances and engagements are somewhat problematic, but are you composing more? Are you uh, composing more for video games? Like, what do you have next on your agenda? Well, a little bit of everything. I mean, I have actually recently wrapped up a couple of video game scores and I'm about to start on a new one. Um, I'm also starting to put together ideas for my next major work, which is going to be a, a requiem mass of sorts for extinct species. I, I, I haven't quite worked out the details yet, but um, I have started writing some music. Um, and it's this idea of, of um, a sort of like, conservation, but also um, celebrating the, uh, the beautiful animal species we've lost over the centuries due to, you know, man-made events, right? And this, this next piece that I'm working on is a, it's, it's a bit of a, you know, a celebration of their lives and also a bit of a warning as well. Right. Um, I want to just, you have made a good portion of your career writing for video games. In, in particular, the Civilization series. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And is that where you see the future of classical music going? I mean, for myself, I think so. Uh, I think film and uh, video game music is certainly the direction that we're going to when it comes to drawing audiences to classical music. Can you talk a little about uh, composing for video games and what your thoughts are on that in the future? Well, I absolutely love writing for video games. I mean, in a way, it's a, it's a great palette to compose for. I mean, generally speaking, the, the, especially the types of games that I score, um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to write music that's not behind dialogue or sound effects or explosions as you would get if you were scoring a film, for example. Um, I think there is a very natural bridge between things like video game music, especially orchestral video game music and classical music. I think, you know, much of the language that media composers employ is sort of borrowed from romantic and modern composers, 20th century composers. Um, and so I think it's only a, it's a short hop between, you know, what we might write for a video game score to a piece like Holst's Planets, for example, you know, or the Firebird Suite or the Rite of Spring. Um, it's, you know, the, the, the connection is there. Um, and I think that what I've enjoyed seeing over the last 10 years or so is that uh, the in aversion to programming a concert of video game music or film music seems to be lessening amongst orchestras. I think that the worlds are becoming connected a little more. Um, and I think that's, that's going to be great for the survival of a classical music in the future too, you know? Yeah, and it's, it's, I do find it interesting here in Winnipeg, we have had one or two concerts that have been completely devoted to video game music and they are always sold out. Like it just, they just sell remarkably well. So it's, a, it's an interesting sign, you know, that uh, we're, how we're drawing our audiences in um, and we're getting sort of a, away from, when I was educated, it was sort of the 12 tone serialist esoteric, um, style of composing. And I think even I'm seeing it more in universities now, composition teachers somewhat moving away from that avant-garde model and moving more to, towards composing, I don't want to say more tonal and accessible music, but more in a way that audiences will be more drawn to it. And through, it's through the venue of a video game or film music that, uh, you know, that's that that's very often happening. It's um, definitely. Well, 
I, I mean, I agree with that. And, I'll, you know, before I answer that point, I'll, I'll give an interesting note. I actually conducted mm. a video game music concert in Winnipeg years ago. Video Games Live, that was a, a touring concert of, um, of video game music. Um, I can't remember the year, but I actually, I was in your beautiful city uh, conducting that concert myself years ago. Um, and I look forward to coming back to Winnipeg someday. Yeah, uh, it, would be, it would be great and great to have you here. Um, um, on the on the topic of I, I just want to address this point before we move yep. on on the topic of um you know what you're seeing in the new music scene these days I am actually also very um, excited about the fact that it's no longer you no longer have to be a serialist or you know you know, a spectralist or you know whatever ist is the most um, prominent sort of academic uh, school of thought at the moment you know I think what I, I enjoy seeing especially amongst my colleagues who are, you know, North American composers, is sort of a return to tonalism, right? And, you know, we're not just talking, um, you know, sort of like, we're not talking necessarily, you know, the Ludovico and Audis of the world or anything like that, but even um, a lot of my colleagues uh, at Boozy and Hawks, like Anna Klein, you know, she, I, I very much like her work and it's very, very, uh, it embraces tonalism quite a bit, you know, or Jennifer Higdon, or, um, or uh, Mason Bates, for example. Right. Um, and of, of course, all the choral composers out there, Eric Whitaker, Ola Yalo, you know, Ola all Yalo. of us, we write tonally because the, the inherent limitations of the voice sort of demand that you write easier to sing music, right? Yeah, and, and it's, it's, right. It's, so I remember seeing an interview with the Finnish composer, Anu Yuhani Radavara, and he talks about this period where you know he sort of went through the sort of atonal thing and he essentially said towards the end of his life he was sort of realizing mm, maybe we should lean more to the uh to the tonal side of things and he, i mean even for a composer like radavara even he sort of moved more to the towards that tonal center as it were well i mean my one of my personal favorite composers is aaron copeland right, right. And, you know, what I love about Aaron Copeland is, you know, he's one of these great American symphonists who embraced the vernacular and embraced folk music, right? And, you know, you get that across the centuries, right? I mean, across the 20th century, Gershwin embracing jazz or, or Bernstein embracing Broadway, right? I mean, I think there's a great tradition of Americans just, you know, like, like acknowledging um, great tunes and, and folk melodies and stuff like that. Uh, long before Copeland wrote Appalachian Spring, uh, you know, he wrote his organ symphony. And if you listen to that, you would think you were listening to Messiaen, right? I mean, it's pretty out there. I mean, and of course he was, he was skewered himself. I mean, he was called a sellout by his colleagues for, you know, writing um, chord progressions, right? A perfect fit. Um, yeah, it's, it's a real shame. I mean, but, you know, a lot of his, his most gorgeous music, of course, was, you know, his embrace of things like shaker hymns, for example. And I, I just love that tradition. Yeah. And it's interesting talking about folk tunes. When I think of American folk tunes, the first composer that pops into my head is Charles Ives. Yeah. Right. You know? And Ives did it in a, on a whole other scale, you know, like it's, you know, but again, he sort of kept it within the tonal realm. You might hear three or four American songs all at the same time yeah exactly <laughs> he had two tonal realms going on at the same time yeah and, and, yeah, and still and still have it be accessible it's uh you know it's what's wonderful and it's nice you know at the risk of getting on a soapbox it's nice to see that sort of like i said switch from atonality esoteric avant-garde to more um the tonal tonal and accessible music um if people want to find out more about you, Christopher Tin, where can they go? Can is there a website or uh, that they can go to and follow you to see what you're what you're up to next? Well, the starting point would probably be my website, ChristopherTin.com. But really, you can hear my music anywhere music is streamed or sold. I mean, it's on all the services. I have a very active YouTube channel. I'm very interactive with my community and all my fans. I even have a a Reddit sub forum, a subreddit, if anyone's on Reddit and wants to chat. Um, I, you know, in this day and age, uh, composers, you know, we can't just hide in the background, you know, and publish our music and, and come out on stage every once in a while and wave after the, the piece is performed. You know, we, we're we very much this next generation of people who go out there and em embrace the audience and, and, and interact with people and, and just, you know, show that we're normal human beings too. And that we're actually kind of a good hang sometimes as well. So, I mean, ChristopherTin.com is a great place to start. My YouTube channel, youtube.com slash ChristopherTin, also very good. 
Nice, nice. Chris, it's been just a real treat for chatting with you today. It's been just great talking about this wonderful oratorio to shiver the sky. We're going to hear a selection of it right now. Thank you very much for having me, Chris. It's been great chatting with you, and I hope to see you in Winnipeg sometime soon. Yes, definitely. <laughs> 